Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar. And um, I'm going to give it another minute to let we still see a number of people uh, joining. So I'm going to give it one more minute and then we'll get underway. Thank you. Okay, let's um, let's get underway. And again, thank you for joining us today for this uh, webinar. Uh, it's it's one that we have found to be very important, and will <clears throat> give you some insight into some of the ESD myths that, uh, if you don't understand them, they can be very costly, and some of them are a bit controversial. So um, I would encourage you to challenge us or raise questions uh, as we go through. And you can do that by um, raising your hand in Zoom and we'll uh, turn on your, uh, I'll let you turn on your microphone. And um, with me today, I have Arnie Steinman and Ginger Hansel, who will be our, my co-pilots. And, and of course I'm Ted Danglemeyer. And I know most of you know us. Uh, we have uh, put together a, a really a great team of experts. Uh, Terry Welsher is one of the key members also. And Jeff Dunahoo is our design expert. So um, he's got some fascinating uh, design analytical techniques that I just am really, really uh, fascinated with. And you can see from this, this slide that we have had uh, engagements all over the world, some really interesting ones. And um, I'll just point out a couple of things here in uh, Australia. I got to sail a, a skipper, a 33 foot sloop in Sydney Harbor, right up to the uh, music hall and under the bridge in uh, Brazil. I uh, got to tour the Amazon and met a pilot from the town next to me in New Hampshire. And uh, also got to go to Hawaii to help with the Gemini Observatory, installing a, a quarter of a million dollar CCD arrays that had a 10 volt ESD sensitivity. And Ginger got to go to Alaska in the winter. And I'm sure uh, she feels a little left out in the other visits, but all kidding aside, we've had some really intriguing challenges and solutions. Uh, we provide strictly professional services and uh, um, are, are pleased to do so. I'm going to move along and uh, show you uh, the slides here. Let me go here. First of all, I just wanted to uh, share with you uh, some upcoming training opportunities. And um, for registration, you can go to our website and register for the, uh, the ones that I'm going to show you shortly. Uh, first of all, on our website, there are many complimentary opportunities that you do not have to register for. And I'll just give you a sense of where they are and where, you know, how to find them and what they are. <clears throat> this is our homepage. And this button here, the video button, has a collection of complimentary training videos. They're all short, you know, five minutes, roughly, uh, a few minutes each on some very, very important technical topics. So I'd encourage you to go there and, and uh, look at them and, and, and certainly send any questions our way that you may have. 
the uh, webinars that we do, we record them. So you can go to this link and view uh, webinars that we have delivered in the past. And this one will be posted there uh, next week. We, uh, what else can I tell you here? I think that's probably the highlights of what I wanted to show you. I do want to emphasize this though. Um, Jeff, our design expert, um, has written children's books. And believe me, they are fascinating. Um, and a total surprise, Jeff is so highly technical and competent. Um, it just seemed incongruous, but he actually is, uh, has written some really interesting books. And here's one on ESD that um, Ginger tells me um, when she showed it to her, her uh, mother, her mother finally understood what Ginger does, Ginger Hansel course. And uh, let's see, this is the book that I've written that most of you know about. Anyway, that's that's kind of the quick tour. Now, if we go back to this, uh, we in July, July uh, 20th, we'll be doing our annual workshop virtually again this year. And um, would encourage you to register. There li there's limited seating. Uh, so if you intend to go, register sooner than later, and uh, we'll cover uh, you know, some very important technology uh, issues to deal with the upcoming trends that we're facing with extreme sensitivities. And then in September, <clears throat> we'll do another TR-53 auditor certification course. Now, this course includes TR-53 but we've also added a critically important charge device model, charge board event, and cable discharge event um, information that is typically missing from a TR-53 certification course. So uh, please uh, join us, we'd love to have you. Now, here are the myths that we'll be covering. Uh, I'm not gonna spend time referring to them now, I'm just going to introduce them here one at a time, and then we'll cover each one as we proceed through uh, today's webinar. <clears throat> and uh, as a preliminary, there are a few acronyms. Uh, ESD Program Management is the title of my book that I just showed you, and we do make reference to that. Uh, we have QMS, which is, I think, pretty common knowledge, uh, quality management system, uh, ESD uh, QMS best practices benchmarking. This is a benchmarking strategy that we developed, uh, uh, Terry and I actually developed it for at and when the two of us were managing <clears throat> the, the entire at and entity or Lucent in its final days with 67 manufacturing sites. So we developed this benchmarking strategy that is incredibly insightful and really valuable for uh, measuring and reporting progress. Of course, we have the human body model, charge device model, charge board event, cable discharge event, <clears throat> and electrical overstress, which we have you know, a very simple de definition here of uh, I see uh, damage due to over uh, stressing with uh, over voltage or current. Now, as a um, reminder to most of you, the ESD <clears throat> technology or ESD damage, I think I may have caught Ginger's laryngitis. She's down in Texas, of course, but <clears throat> my voice is uh, reacting. Anyway, um, ESD is both a quality and a reliability issue. If you're fortunate, let me get up there, you experience catastrophic failure, meaning that it fails in the factory, you uh, locate it and replace it. That's the, the best of options. However, there is what's known as cumulative damage, where the device is subjected to sub-threshold uh, stresses, 
that uh, become cumulative and eventually result in failure. And uh, then we have latency, the worst of all, where the device fails in time due to prior damage. Now, all of these are discussed uh, in some depth in my, my book with um, years of carefully contr uh, controlled engineering studies in the manufacturing process with high volume. <clears throat> so if you'd like more of the details and data, uh, help yourself. I also wanted to alert you to the fact that in general, optoelectronic devices are more susceptible to latent uh, failure and latent behavior. What you're looking at here is, are LEDs, where two of them are uh, properly illuminated and this one in the middle is not at full intensity. And the reason for that is ESD damage. This image, by the way, came right out of a Sylvania, Sylvania uh, applications note, uh, cautioning uh, users of the LEDs about the latency <clears throat> damage from ESD. One of the things that these myths will help uh, dispel is, uh, or explain or emphasize is the importance of having your own internal expertise. <clears throat> you really need to understand the technology fully so that you can avoid uh, the pitfalls and some extraordinary expenses that can result. And this list gives you a sense of what we're talking about. These are actual numbers that we have recorded over the years from clients <clears throat> where um, they were using uh, gloves for ESD purposes and that, that was the sole purpose. Uh, we have learned that ESD gloves, although they're, they have a good resistance, they will actually, actually are high charging to your product. So you're better off without them. Packaging costs, this was, this was one company where they were uh, literally wasting $400,000 a year in packaging. And down the list, um, class zero controls, CDM controls and humidity controls all have considerable expense if you don't understand the technology and you don't know <clears throat> how to mitigate them cost in a cost-effective and technically sound manner. And let's see here. Let's go on to the next slide. This is <clears throat> a chart out of the ESD Association's uh, 2020 Technology Roadmap. And this gives us a sense of the trends <clears throat> looking forward uh, that tell us that we're gonna be dealing with these extreme sensitivities in the foreseeable future. And here, what we have is, let's see, we have somebody that wants to get in. Uh, let me, I'm gonna add, add you in, Mark, sorry. <clears throat> um, this shows the range of thresholds for charge device model relative to time. And you can see back in the mid, uh, the 70s and uh, early 80s, uh, sensitivities were in this range, 200 to or 250 to over 500. The sensitivities uh, peaked, uh, the robustness, I should say, peaked in the mid 90s. And then technology uh, demands have resulted in a decline in device robustness. So the devices are becoming increasingly sensitive and more and more often we find uh, class zero devices uh, in production and uh, triggering all kinds of uh, issues, reliability, failure. We have clients calling saying, you know, we're, we're running 100% failure rate. Can you drop what you're doing and, and come and help? So be, be aware, it, if you don't have it today, uh, it's coming. And if you don't have charge device model sensitivity data, you don't know whether you have them or not typically, because uh, 
the CDM data is difficult to come by and many of the class zero devices are CDM. Oh, let me go back here. Okay, that brings us to the first myth. Uh, one, S2020 is sufficient for class zero technologies. Well, as good as it is 2020, uh, if you have components outside the scope of the document, uh, you cannot be assured that it will provide you the protection needed. So you uh, are well advised to include additional precautions and requirements for, uh, I'll repeat these acronyms for you, um, charge device model, charge board event, and cable discharge event. And I'll elaborate. Here is a slide that helps illustrate it. Uh, 2020 encompasses uh, many great aspects to the document, but there are things missing like the ones I just spoke about and things like design and protection don't really belong in the document. They are outside the scope but vitally important as you'll learn in a few minutes. So as good as 2020 is, there are some important technical elements that are missing. And it actually lags the technology uh, 10 to 15 years in those areas. The scope of the document uh, is, uh, tells us that it provides protection for HBM sensitivities um, at or above 100 volts. You've probably heard that frequently. And likewise for CDM, it's at or above 200 volts. So again, if you're outside that, tech, that scope, um, you are running risk of uh, major reliability and quality excursions. And uh, also it, uh, asserts a protection for charged metal objects uh, below 35 volts. However, there are no surface resistance requirements in the document, and that is one of the key uh, metrics for managing a charge device and charge board event damage that we'll discuss in a minute. And uh, if the item is large enough and charged to 35 volts, it can pose a high risk. In fact, I'll give you an example of a screwdriver where that was the case. Not a particularly large item, but proved to be problematic. So we advise uh, start with 2020, it's the best available and customize it if, especially if you have or expect or anticipate components that are outside the scope of, of 2020. Adding, uh, again, these three uh, characteristics, charge board event, cable discharge event, and charge device model. Here is the uh, example that I wanted to share on a screwdriver. This was a very interesting case study. This was a defense manufacturing company and they had um, three devices on one circuit board with confirmed charge device model damage on the same board. And uh, the risk to the program was high enough that they actually put the program on pause. They, they brought everything to a standstill and asked us to go through the entire supply chain to uh, locate root cause. Now, clearly there were many items that we found, but the most likely uh, smoking gun was this ordinary yellow handled screwdriver. Believe it or not, in fact, uh, Terry Walsher and I and Ginger and Arnie, we were all very surprised at this discovery. Um, and I'll, I'm gonna actually do a quick demonstration for you in a second. So uh, here we have an oscilloscope set up with a current probe so that we can measure discharge currents uh, from the, the tip of the screwdriver. Now this tip is an isolated conductor. Um, and uh, here, uh, there's the current probe. Now, 
the handle, the level of charge or voltage on the handle, of course, varies all over the place. In this work, um, it was charged between 1,000 and 6,000 volts. And uh, corresponding to that, the tip of the screwdriver, the potential on it varied between 28 and 300 volts. Now, 28 volts is below the uh, 35 volt number in 2020. So now, um, here's the surprising part. And the, the oscilloscope actually displays this, but it's the fine print is too hard to read. What we measured was a discharge, a range of discharge currents between two and seven amps which was very surprising to us. The component in question failed with a two amp stress. So um, it was uh, very likely that this, the, you know, the discharges from this screwdriver could inject current strong enough to cause the failures. With close examination, we found that the fixturing used for the components and transporting them required use of a screwdriver and incredibly close to the corner pin that was failing on the chip on the boards. So after you know detailed analysis, we were convinced and, and were able to prove that the screwdriver did in fact cause this uh, failure and was the primary uh, root cause of failure. Now, uh, I'm gonna just give you a quick illustration of this um, right now. And then uh, let's go here. Okay, you should be able to see um, this setup, this workstation setup. And what I have here is an ESD ground, grounded ESD mat. Uh, I'm going to put my wrist strap on, like so. It's a hard to see, but it's on. I have an ESD event detector here, and I have uh, this container filled with nuts and bolts that you can imagine as you shake it, um, they are different potentials triggering ESD events. Now, if I turn on the event detector and I'm gonna tip it a little bit to see if that helps with the glare. Yeah, it does, okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna shake it at some distance away and I'm gonna put it up here, no reaction to the event, well, I'm actually, before I get into that, some of you may not be familiar with event detectors. When a discharge, an ESD discharge occurs, it radiates an RF transient that can be detected with event detectors like this, and there are a collection available on the, in the industry, or with an oscilloscope set up with the right antenna. So uh, there are many ways to, to do this, and I'm gonna illustrate this one instrument and, uh, and the screwdriver scenario. So I'm shaking, creating low level ESD events, no reason, well, let me go one step further. I forgot to tell you, I uh, meant to tell you that this instrument will trigger an audible sound when a discharge occurs and the, the LEDs will flash on the screen. Uh, you may not be able to hear the event detector because of the way uh, the, the microphone pick responds, but uh, you'll be able to see the LEDs uh, illuminating. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna shake this and bring it close to the antenna. And now you can see the LEDs flashing and the number there now displayed is 125 discharges that occurred. So the event detector reports discharges. And now what I have here is a, 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 a plastic handled screwdriver isolated metal conductor and a grounded tip. I'm gonna manipulate it with my hand and of course it won't trigger it. I'm gonna bring it a little closer and I'm gonna check the sensitivity of the, of the detector. And there we go. Now I'm manipulating it with my hand and we're getting ESD events 
like so. Pretty regularly now. Actually, as I was doing this, I figured I, I decided we may not have a good ground connection here, which is why the plate wasn't responding. Now we're getting it quite regularly. Whereas if I do the same thing with a pair of uh, ESD uh, uh, screwdriver, nothing happens. You manipulate it, it's got a conductive handle, therefore we no longer have the isolated conductor. So now that part of the risk is gone. However, in a few minutes, I'm going to show you, you can still damage a circuit board or a component with this ESD screwdriver if the product is charged. Okay, let's go back to the slide set. Uh, before I do that, uh, does anybody have any uh, questions or, if you do, by the way, feel free to put them in the chat window. Arnie is tracking that and will alert me. Or you can raise your hand and we'll uh, talk about it. Okay, so now uh, here is an example of what I was talking about. Here we have a class zero device. The sensitivity was way outside the scope of 2020. It was a sensitivity of around uh, 60, 60 volts. So it was way below the 200 volt CDM limit. Uh, so as good, as, again, as I said earlier, as good as 2020 is, it was unable to protect uh, that level of sensitivity. Um, and by adding the additional CDM and, and a cable discharge event requirements in this case, that resolved the yield problem with a considerable effort and uh, time and effort through the course of a year, they were able to get to 100% yields. Now, okay, number two. The uh, human body model dominates ESD failures. Uh, often people think that, oh, though less today than in previous uh, years, but we have come to learn uh, through irrefutable sources that the major, uh, the primary uh, failure mechanism today is CDM in nature. And that includes automated equipment, machines, et cetera isolated metal, uh, that screwdriver would trigger a CDM-like event and stress. So CDM best replicates uh, the vast majority of failures today. Now, as a refresher, uh, here is a animation of the human body model. And as we come in here, we have uh, a person charged discharging to the device. And then there's a schematic here that represents that, the charged person discharging to a grounded device. And that is to create a worst case stress. So the charge flows from the person through the device to ground. The charge device model is also what it sounds like. Uh, and here is an animated sketch of that, where what we're talking about is the device becoming charged and then discharging. And here is that animation. The device slid out of a defective uh, shipping tube and landed on a conductive surface and uh, experienced the charge device model stress. Now, without getting into all the details, uh, it's a little beyond the scope of this webinar, uh, it turns out that the conductive surface does not even need to be grounded. The, uh, the, 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 char the capacitance of the device versus the capacitance of the object that's come in contact with allows an instantaneous transfer in uh, a few picoseconds. Now, um, What's important here is to note that these two variables that we've highlighted are key in mitigating charge device and charge board event damage. Uh, the capacitance of the device governs the level of charge that can be stored 
and therefore has a direct relationship to the amplitude of the discharge current. The contact, well, let me add one more thing. Uh, the, the, the amount of, well, I'm gonna get into that in another slide, but the, the, the potential that can be on the device also has a direct bearing on that mechanism over here. The contact resistance is another opportunity for mitigating CDM or charge board event damage. If you have the right materials at the right location in the process, uh, you can mitigate uh, CDM damage very, very effectively. And uh, what I alluded to early in the, the previous slide here is that uh, the vast majority of failures today are CDM in nature. In fact, um, it's argued that 99.9% of the failures today are CDM, or best replicated by CDM. Now this, uh, this table also came out of the ESD Association Technology Roadmap. And besides being a good eye test, um, it, it's, a, it's a, a basic tool for approximating, um, and I'm gonna emphasize approximating device sensitivity. What we're looking at here, as we go from left to right, we're talking about physically larger pin counts and physically larger devices. That relates to the capacitance variable we spoke about a minute ago. So the bigger it is, the higher the capacity to, to store charge. Therefore, the higher the discharge current, stronger. Now, as we go from top to bottom, we're looking at higher operating speeds. You get up into some uh, RF devices, uh, you can have some very high operating speeds. Now, if you combine the two, in other words, you have a large device at very high operating speeds, it's going to land in this lower right-hand corner. And uh, for those who might not be able to read it, uh, these numbers in here are the CDM threshold uh, numbers, estimated numbers. And down in the red is 120, less than 120 volt sensitivity. So if you have a high speed, high speed device that's physically large, it's in much greater uh, risk than a low pin count at uh, low operating speeds. Anyway, a rule of thumb kind of way of estimating sensitivity can be very useful uh, in the absence of uh, threshold data, which is very, very important to go after. You have to aggressively go after the CDM data to uh, get it from the IC suppliers. They make it difficult, unfortunately. Uh, this is a sketch of the CDM simulator. And I wanted to show this to you to help introduce the charge board event. Here we have a field plate that is biased by a voltage power supply. And an insulative layer here of specific uh, dimensions and properties. And then the device is positioned with the pins facing upward. And then the discharge probe comes down from above to complete the CDM discharge. So that's the, the fundamental principle of the simulators uh, as specified in um, the association uh, standard on CDM stress testing. And that is um, JS002. Now, if we go uh, take this principle and go one step further to understanding the difference between HBM and CDM, this chart goes a long way. Here we have an image of uh, HBM damage. This was actually a field return failure, a real world uh, failure coming back from uh, the field. And the magnification is 200X. And you can see the burn spot here between the uh, bipolar junctions. 
And this isn't your typical uh, discharge transient uh, for HBM, where we're talking, you know, 160 roughly nanoseconds for the pulse and a peak current of one amp. Now, if we look at CDM, it's quite, quite, it's, it's totally, well, it's not totally different, but it's quite, quite different. Now we're looking at 4,000 times actual size. And here we see a tiny pinhole, often very difficult to find. And the failure analysis uh, expertise needed to find it is greater. You really need some capable uh, FA houses to, to locate it. Now look at the difference here at the same stressing voltages. The peak current for CDM is 13 amps versus one amp for HBM. But also notice the rise time here. The, the whole major, the primary episode is finished in one nanosecond. And you have rise times in picoseconds. Now, what does this tell us? It tells us a couple of things, that the designed in protection strategy is different. Uh, there's a lot of overlap, but uh, it is different. And the uh, rise time also tells us that the manufacturing mitigation techniques have different properties as well. Uh, the HBM measures that are in place are critically important. You have to do them uh, to even begin to approach a CDM mitigation. This chart helps explain it a little bit further. Here uh, we have the schematic we saw earlier arranged differently a little bit. <clears throat> Here we have the device capacitance and the surface resistance at the point of contact. Now, um, one of these two strategies is covered in uh, S2020 and the other uh, not so well. Here we have the capacitance of the device and that governs uh, the peak discharge current. The higher the voltage at discharging it triggers higher discharge currents. So you definitely need to manage uh, voltage on the device. Now there's another opportunity with uh, surface resistance. Here we're talking about resistance at the point of contact. And it's critical that it's at the point of contact. Um, that is a discussion in itself, but uh, let me just, let me just suffice to say that the location of the resistance and the properties of the resistance have a direct bearing on the success. For instance, a discrete resistor will not benefit in this way, whereas a homogeneous dissipative material such as an ESD mat will. So um, we advocate adding surface resistance requirements to uh, introduce this opportunity for managing um, and protecting from CDM and charge board event. When Terry and I were managing AT&T, we found this strategy to be the most robust, less prone to human error, and most cost-effective. Uh, as I said earlier, and I'm not gonna dwell on this, we, we now know that uh, the vast majority of failures are CDM in nature. However, I do want to reemphasize that the HBM requirements in S2020 are a prerequisite for CDM charge board event and cable discharge controls. Without HBM in place, uh, CDM mitigation is virtually impossible. Okay, charge board events are less sensitive, charge boards are less sensitive to ESD than our devices or standalone devices. This is myth number three. What we now know uh, is that exposed circuit boards, this is before they're fully enclosed in a system and are in the manufacturing line as an example. They are more vulnerable or can be 
more vulnerable to ESD damage than standalone individual components. And again, that's because of the much greater capacity to store charge and much stronger discharge currents. Here is a study um, conducted uh, by analog devices and some follow-up work that we helped with. Uh, in fact, if you want to read this in detail, go to our website. There's a, 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 a the whole article is there that we helped uh, author. Um, but what we're looking at is a, a charge device uh, or CDM simulator for components that has been repurposed for um, repurposed for charge board event. This is the component that was failing and uh, customer returns were indicting it and initial diagnostics suggested that the damage was so severe, it probably was not ESD, but rather electrical overstress. But the circuit designer said, you know, where it's happening doesn't lend itself to uh, charge device damage, or it doesn't lend itself, I should let me say that differently, does not lend itself to electrical overstress uh, due to uh, voltage or power supplies. So they decided to investigate the charge board event. And lo and behold, that is what uh, they used to duplicate the, da the damage. So it turned out to be a charge board event. <clears throat> now here is a short video I'm gonna show you. Um, start it and uh, yeah. here. This is, uh, again, the event detector. And in this case, prior to this exercise, there were three discharges recorded. This person had on a cordless wrist strap, which uh, you hopefully you know by now don't work. Um, this person was ungrounded by virtue of wearing a cordless wrist strap, a wireless, cordless, I guess cordless is the right term. And the board is now being plugged into the system. And watch what happens with this single insertion. <laughs> with that single insertion, there were eight additional discharges. So uh, there were eight stresses injected into this board with that single insertion. Good illustration of the charge board event. And here is the resulting damage. This is on the left is the CDM damage to a component I showed you earlier. And here is the damage at 200X, like the HBM example earlier. But this is the charge board event damage. Now notice at the same amplification magnification for the HBM image earlier, we're seeing massive, comparatively massive damage to the, the device inside, uh, uh, inside the device mounted on the circuit board. When analog devices figured this out, they went through their uh, database and determined that up to 50% of previously indicted electrical overstress failures were actually ESD through the charge board event. This is a huge discovery that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Also peak currents as high as 25 amps have been measured from charged boards. Here's another example where we have uh, a device where it had a current failure level of five amps. You charge the device alone to 250 volts, discharge it, and the peak current is below that failure level, that failure current, the peak current. You put the same device on a circuit board, charge it to 250 volts, and you exceed the failure level and experience device failure. That's another illustration of the, uh, this, this discovery. 
This is a case study where it was a mature product line, it had been in production for years, almost 100% yields day in and day out. Overnight, uh, they started experiencing uh, almost 50, 40% 40, 40 failure rates. And the device that was failing had uh, strong uh, CDM characteristics or thresholds. After a great deal of effort, it was determined that uh, a new a supplier for the plastic faceplate, which is here, uh, resulted in the this faceplate inherently charging to much higher uh, potentials much more easily. And that is actually what was the root cause. And it was detected at in-circuit test. You take these boards with highly charged faceplates, test them at in-circuit test, and the damage was resulting right there. Now, um, I'm going to demonstrate this uh, for you. Uh, this is uh, a charge board event demonstration. Let me uh, bring in, I'm going to bring in some other props here. I'll turn on my camera. Okay, now we're going to bring into view is this piece of black foam. Now, you might be saying that's probably ESD foam. Well, just because it's black doesn't mean it's ESD, as I'm about to show you. Uh, I'm going to take this field meter, which I zeroed uh, earlier, and I'm going to measure it just as it sits here. And it's not too highly charged right now. It's about a thousand volts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take there's like cotton cloth right here. I'm going to take a cotton cloth and rub this uh, material and test it again. And now what we're getting. I can't, I can't get close enough to get a, I'm going to get, I'm going to cheat a little bit and lock it in. I, I, I couldn't get within one inch because it was going over the limit of this instrument. Uh, this one has an upper range of 20 kV. So this foam is actually above 20 kV sitting on a grounded mat, which shouldn't be too big a surprise. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring into view this uh, circuit board isolated from me by the handle. And I'm again, I'm still grounded. And I'm going to uh, ground the board. So we're starting at a neutral position. I'm going to place it here on the mat. Turn the event detector back on. And this time I'm going to take the ESD tweezers, as I, uh, not the ESD tweezers, the ESD screwdriver, as I uh, said I would earlier, and touch it to the board. I'm, I'm, again, I'm grounded. We know we have an ESD uh, screwdriver. And we're getting multiple ESD events. I don't know if you can hear it, probably can't, but you can see the LEDs flashing on the instrument, on the event detector. So it's definitely um, charged and discharging. That is simply put the charge board event. Now, if I lift it up off the mat, we've changed the system and the system is no longer balanced. So if I ground it again with the same screwdriver, we get more discharges. That's known as double jeopardy. Now, um, I'm going to bring this out of the way and I'm going to bring into view this uh, mylar could be a document holder it wasn't designed as such but I'm going to uh, rub it I can't see me rubbing it but I'm rubbing it or I could rub it with it and I'm going to test it and now you can see uh, I, I'm having this is measuring about that's a little less, a little less than the 
the poem was, but we're still at 17, 18 kV. I'm going to place this on the mat. And again, I'm going to remove any charge from the board. Now we know this is charged almost the same potential. I'm going to place it here on the mat. And now I'm going to ground it again with the screwdriver. We've got one discharge. Whereas before we had repeated discharges. Take it up off the mat. And now we're getting discharges again. So that, by the way, this, what the reason this did not trigger uh, many, or it triggered only one discharge, is a term called voltage suppression. Go to our website and uh, check out the demonstration video on that if you're not familiar with it. Um, the message here is that uh, there are some very important parameters with uh, these myths that need to be understood. And um, by the way, this type of image is how we do our virtual uh, training, especially for uh, um, certification training. We, we let the students tell me exactly what to do and, um, and determine if they're giving me the proper instruction. Okay, so now uh, design hip protection is well understood. Well, uh, in many respects it is. There's an awful lot that's understood. Um, but we have found that the absence of a robust design is actually the most costly of the ESD issues. And you can see examples that I've included here uh, and mentioned earlier. Uh, Device failures, been, because of design issues, have been as high as 100%. And in one case study, I'm going to show you um, a design issue resulted in a one, and that's a billion, that's not a mistake, that's $1 billion in lost uh, sales revenue. Now, this is a typical lab bench in an engineering lab. Uh, it's, it's a universal occurrence. I, I don't care whether we're in France or Australia um, or China, this is what it looks like in design labs. So uh, my team, you know, Terry, Ginger, Arnie, Jeff, we've all decided that there must be a, an international law of physics that we're just not familiar with, namely that engineers don't uh, generate static. Now I mentioned that, I actually mentioned that to one of my classes and one of the students uh, said, I know why engineers don't generate static. And I said, why is that? Well, it's because they, they don't have any potential. Okay, this is the 100% failure rate case study I mentioned earlier. Uh, here, the design transfer did not include ESD sensitivity information. It came into manufacturing unannounced. And in many instances, the uh, uh, given lots, the failure rate was 100%. And uh, we tried everything, you name it. We, we, spent, we spent over $300,000 trying to solve it in the factory. And uh, we're unacceptable, un unsuccessful due to the extreme sensitivities. Um, what we did is we, we developed a custom shunt to go temporarily over the chip that was failing. And that gave us immediate relief uh, and yields approaching 100% and an annual savings of $6 million per year. So uh, it was a wild uh, situation that worked out quite well. Here is the telecommunications system that I mentioned earlier that uh, resulted in a billion dollars. So that's a B with lost sales revenue. Um, the design team had not evaluated the system uh, for ESD vulnerability. And it turned out to be a very expensive ESD event detector. You could be 15 feet away, shake coins or keys in your pocket and send the system into major alarm. 
when the vice president of New York Telephone realized that, he said, rip out all the equipment. And if it were up to him, he wouldn't buy our, our product line again. Fortunately, we worked our way out of it, but it was uh, nasty. And again, a design issue that was avoidable. Here is uh, very briefly uh, some of the work that Jeff does for us. Uh, I find it fascinating. If you have a board or a system or failures that are occurring, this method, without going to it in depth, although there is a video again on our website that explains it in more detail, this allows us to visualize, visualize actual current flow in a circuit board under stress. So you inject a stress over here. Uh, you can see the board light up. Um, and the current flowing through the, the board uh, was causing the upset here at the ethernet port. So the message, the message here though, is that with this methodology and, and nanosecond uh, time uh, gradients, you can accurately create visual uh, images of the current flowing. Every designer that we've worked with to date has been surprised at what they saw. They did not expect to see the uh, current behavior that uh, this revealed. Very, very uh, compelling technology, fascinating to me. Terry and I have often said we could have saved millions and hundreds of millions of dollars if we had known this when we were back in the Lucent days. Okay, airflow. Does it cause charging? No except for a few exceptions, uh, and we'll get into that. Um, here is an illustration where we have a compressed air gun. You uh, direct it at an object uh, and the airflow will not charge that object unless perhaps there's some vibration or particulate in the airflow. It has to be either liquid or solid in the airflow to trigger surface charging. Just the air by itself won't do it. Here's an extreme example of particulate in the airflow. And you can imagine that sandblasting triggers a very, very strong uh, charging mechanism. Here is an excerpt from work that Ben Baumgartner did uh, and published at the Association Proceedings in 1992. And here what we're talking about is airflow going through tubing. You think there's plenty of surface area contact. If air charges, it should show. Well, <coughs> the surface resistance of the materials of the tubing, the various choices of the tubing, we're all well into the insulative range. Rubbing uh, the materials with your finger uh, created these potentials. However, the airflow was consistently less than, uh, created less than 10 volts charging. Now, uh, looking at it a little differently, now what we're talking about is uh, comparing airflow uh, directed at objects. Here we have the, uh, the same finger charging, aluminum, very low charging, uh, the other materials, high charging by rubbing it with your finger. The airflow um, from the gun was less than 10 volts, from a fan was less than 10 volts. Again, the airflow by itself does not trigger charging unless there are other uh, variables uh, doing so. You know, for instance, you might, if you're, you have, uh, you're cleaning a board with maybe alcohol and you blow it off too quickly, that removal of the liquid might charge the surface. You'd have to test to see. Metal shielding layers are essential. Well, the truth is that there are many alternatives that work in many, many applications. There are exceptions, and uh, we're talking here about technologies with very, very small air gaps. 
reticles are the um, <clears throat> the items that are used to generate semiconductors. It's in the uh, photolithography area. So you have tiny, tiny line widths and spacings. Soft filters have a similar scenario. Just the mere presence of a, a field gradient will trigger failure in these items. So if you're dealing with, uh, you're debating between dissipative and shielding, here are some considerations. One, we advocate dissipative materials for intimate contact with extreme sensitivities. It gives you a tremendous level of added benefit. <clears throat> Conductive materials, on the other hand, pose an unnecessary risk. And as I said a minute ago, devices that fail simply in the presence of a field are extremely rare. <clears throat> as a one illustration of that, uh, circuit board designs, like you can ask Jeff about this, um, the circuit board designers go to great lengths uh, to minimize path lengths and minimize the possibility of uh, EMI disruptions and interference. So as a result, field gradients on boards are almost invariably not strong enough to trigger uh, damage, even to extreme sensitivity uh, components. Uh, 3M had a demonstration years ago where they set up an extremely um, unrealistic demonstration and showed me that you just wave a, a cup near this MOSFET fixture and the MOSFET would fail. Well, I said, well, can I just make a minor change? I took a sheet of uh, pink poly, laid it over the fixture. And even with that, uh, whoops, even with that, wh where'd it go? How did that happen? Uh, even, uh, even with this extreme, worse than worst case scenario, um, with the pink poly sitting over it, uh, it they, he was unable to damage the device with the a styrofoam cup. And uh, fields, the message here is that fields can be dealt with by using air gaps in many respects, not all. Um, arcing through a static dissipated bag without shielding uh, below 5 kV is highly unlikely. In fact, I'm going to show you some surprising data that uh, Terry and his team at Bell Labs um, gathered in the, in the lab. Um, half inch air gap can provide um, 25 kV and higher uh, arc through protection or, or uh, discharge shielding protection. Uh, published studies on shielding effectiveness often involve extreme worst case scenarios that are not realistic. Sound programs uh, have been very successful without the use of shielding materials. However, uh, there are military, as an example, there are military applications that require shielding. So you, if, if that's the case, you have to comply. It just helps to understand that if you, if you understand this myth well enough, you can comply even with military requirements and reduce operating expenses within the factory. Here is the study that Terry and his team did at Bell Labs. Very interesting uh, study. This also is in my book. Um, I know many of you have a copy, but um, here we have, we, what, this, this evaluation was done a little differently. Uh, a very a class zero, well, not quite. A 200 volt HBM sensitive device was placed inside these bags. And then a simulator gun external to the bag was used to inject transients to uh, device failure until a device failure was experienced. So you take a, a, just a regular insulated bag, could be a sandwich bag, just the thickness of the bag will give you 4 kV protection. 
for this scenario, HPM. The uh, pink poly bags, about the same, 4,500 uh, kV protection. A static dissipated bag uh, gave a little higher protection, five to six kV. Bubble wrap was uh, in this range. And um, even a used bubble wrap material provided uh, six kV protection. Low charging foam wrap was greater than 6,500. Now here's the interesting one, or one of the many, but if you take a, a brand new shielding bag out of the box, uh, the device uh, did not fail uh, until we exceeded uh, 6,500 to 8K, 8,000 volts. And over those levels, we did were able to damage the 200 volt device. So it provided very robust protection. However, the bags were crippled or folded once to simulate limited use, just once. Notice the protection level dropped sharply. Now it was down to five to six kV, which duplicates the performance of a static dissipated bag. Because now you're dealing with, again, the dielectric strength and thickness of the bag material. <laughs> That's why they end up being the same. Because the metalized layer is uh, interrupted with the single crimping. <clears throat> Here is the air gap work that Steve Fowler did uh, with rigid packaging. And he concluded that even an eighth of an inch gap protected class zero devices from HBM discharges up to 35 kV. So the air gap is very powerful technique. And you know what? It's unavoidable. You ship something out the door, you put it in some kind of a container. It could even be just a cardboard box that gives you uh, air gap discharge shielding protection of some level. Are IC tubes um, adequate uh, shipping protection? They are for many, many applications, but not class zero. One of the reasons is that they become static generating with reuse. And um, therefore problematic. Like even a brand new tube uh, can generate up to 200 volts on an integrated circuit. Machine model is a valid simulator related to machines. This is also a myth, one that is um, losing favor in many ways, but one of the key ways is that it um, has been downgraded by the standards bodies <clears throat> and is no longer required uh, for JETIC device qualification. Those of you who know Shavarka Derbe, he, uh, I love his expression here. He refers to MM as the meaningless model. And I'll explain why in, in a minute. Again, a CDM best simulates uh, discharges even from machines or charged, charged or uncharged metal surfaces. Here are uh, six of the reasons that the machine model has been downgraded. <clears throat> the test results do not match real world failure modes. In fact, analog devices has never found a machine model failure in all of their FA activities. No work has been done to replicate real world damage. The title machine uh, model is a misnomer. It uh, <clears throat> does not relate to machines. It was developed as a low voltage HBM test methodology. Thresholds uh, correlate very well with HBM. The discharge waveform with metal to metal contact could be from automation equipment or some any other metal um, contact is best replicated with CDM. And as I said earlier, it's not required for device qualification. So moving on. 
Uh, humidity control is essential for ESD purposes. Well, we have found that strategic use of static dissipated materials and ionization is both more cost effective, more technically effective, and less costly. And I'm going to give you a few examples of this. Here is a table that you may have seen with a very variety of elm materials um, and different uh, humidity levels. <clears throat> At low humidity, you get higher charging. High humidity, you get higher charging, which uh, we all know. Now, without ionization, materials um, will retain that charge for a long period of time, depending on the application. However, <clears throat> with properly positioned strategic ionization, the <clears throat> potential can be removed in just a couple of seconds or less. Here's a chart that helps uh, further with that point. In normal air, you can be talking uh, 36,000 seconds, or, or uh, what would that be, 600 hours can retain the charge. Whereas with ionization, um, you see the worst case is, uh, well, it depends on the application. There's a lot, there are a lot of variables here, but you can see that we're talking seconds rather than um, hours. Here are a couple of case studies to reinforce the thinking. This was a field tracking study that we did uh, when I was working in Bell Laboratories. And it was done in Florida where the relative humidity was consistently higher or in the range of 55%. There was no ionization present. And this was in a telephone central office. Every single board was serialized, monitored, tracked, Every last detail of its handling and processing was documented. And at the end of the day, every failure was analyzed. And in spite of the relative humidity, we found 30% uh, of the failures were ESD damage to components on the circuit boards. This is a central office, another central office example and a test set that was used to verify proper wiring in a new installation. And uh, what, what you had basically was this, this block with thousands of pins and wires coming to it. And um, the test set was looking for uh, continuity and proper wiring. And in this example, the wiring had been installed three months prior to the testing. And the relative humidity was typically 45%. The test set still failed with a 50% failure rate. And that was found uh, throughout the system. So, you know, 90 days after installation, the cabling still had enough charge on it to destroy bipolar devices in a test set. Here's an example um, with high volume manufacturing multiple sites without humidity control and devices uh, with sensitivities as low as 10 volts. Strategic ionization and dissipative materials over a 15 year period um, uh, resulted in this performance with you know, millions of devices being processed. So it's, it's possible to do it but it comes back to what I said earlier. You need to understand these myths and the technology thoroughly to get this level of success. Developing your own internal expertise is a fundamental necessity. Field meters make accurate measurements on machines. You know, um, in the countless factories we've been to, 
we have yet to go to one where they're using field meters correctly. In fact, we uh, have developed a pitfalls class to illustrate the multitude of ways of getting misleading test results from field meters. They're, they're invaluable, they have their place, but again, you need to understand these myths to get full advantage of them and uh, protect your products. One illustration here is uh, here we have a field meter and you can see we're trying to measure the components are right here in this tool. And with the field meter, uh, we are getting very, very low voltages down around a bolt. But look at what the field meter is looking at. It's looking at all of this grounded metal and averaging that into the reading. So that will suppress the fields and make the situation look much better than it actually is. So the field meter really is not the right instrument for this scenario. A better choice would be the electrostatic voltmeter or contact voltmeter, where you can narrow the range of measurement, the area of measurement, or make direct contact with the device that you may be analyzing. Here's another illustration. Um, here we have a vibratory bolt feeder. The uh, measurement on the meter was uh, 500 volts. In fact, I was asked, I, I had to fly all the way to Korea to assess this one. Um, a client had come into a company there and uh, indicted this vibratory feeder as the source of failures downstream, saying that it was charged to 500 volts. Well, it turns out that the engineer using this instrument was not grounded. He was at 500 volts and therefore the meter appeared to be 500 volts, when in fact the, the feeder was at zero volts or close to it. That's yet another pitfall on these meters. Okay, number 10. Um, ionization is sufficient for class zero or all applications. This is not true either. I, I think that was one of the toughest transitions for me personally. To, you know, typically you think you put an ionizer there and you've gotten rid of the problem. Well, it turns out that's not true for components outside the scope of 2020. Here's an illustration. We have, uh, let me back up one, one, one step, Oop, wrong way. I'm gonna enter, here we have an insulator on a work surface and um, charged on both sides. We bring in, whoa, wrong button. We bring in the ionizer and it neutralizes the exposed surface. But the interface between the insulator and the work surface does not benefit from the ionization because the airflow can't get there. Whereas if I lift the, ionize, the insulator up, allow the airflow to get to the other side, it will neutralize it. So there's one of a number of scenarios um, that explain why ionization uh, has its place and is a powerful tool, but not always the answer. Here's another way of illustrating it. If you're you know, dealing with extreme sensitivities, um, what are the chances that you'd be able to consistently keep the voltage on that device below, say, 100 volts or below 10 or below 1 volt in the case of uh, GMR heads? By using voltage control, um, you can't get there from here. Plus, the voltage control is a subject to human error. We always see ionizers facing in the wrong direction. Um, out of calibration, uh, you name it, there are all kinds of scenarios. Here is another example. Now this, um, in this case, a circuit board uh, was being monitored with an electrometer and a continuous 
measurement of the voltage response. The board was then uh, manipulated with a night trial glove. This would be an ESD glove with, uh, that was static dissipative. But as I said earlier, even though they're dissipative, they can be high charging. On the left, with no ionizer, uh, we had peak voltages actually in excess of 250 volts. The, uh, it was saturated at 200 volts. Turning the ionizer on, there were less frequent excursions to that level, but there were still multiple events at 250 volts. So uh, yet another illustration that ionization doesn't solve all of the issues. So in the MR head industry, uh, we found that um, you know, the conventional controls are absolutely essential, but insufficient for that level of sensitivity. When you get below 100 volts, you have to start thinking, wow, you know, even with ionization, that device is still charged. You've got to work uh, around it with dissipative materials. Uh, here's another example. Will ionization work here? Well, the metal work surface is a heat as a sink or, or, you know, to the ions from the ionizer. So they will uh, compromise, this metal surface will compromise the performance of the ionizer dramatically. Here we show ionizers uh, facing in the wrong direction. You've got some down here and some over the wall. Um, and we, at the time we were told that the operators told us that the airflow was drying out their eyes. So they put them over the top of the wall to resolve that. This was amazing. I mean, this looks like a bird's nest. <laughs> um, and we found, actually found this um, at a distance of about 50 to 100 feet with an ESD event detector. The contamination here was so bad that it was arcing inside the ionizer, clearly um, not in the calibration system. And uh, latency, oh, this is a good one. <clears throat> um, it's, it, it's more and more people that I have learned that 90% failure resulting from latency is, is highly unlikely, not impossible, but uh, highly unlikely. Um, it's not zero either. Uh, so we know that it's somewhere in between. And it's something that's so difficult to measure, we probably won't ever know the real accurate assessment of how big a role latency plays. But it certainly uh, bears uh, consideration in, in the development of your program. And uh, we also advocate treating all optoelectronic devices as class zero because of their tendency to uh, fail with a latent behavior. Here's a case study um, whoop, where we stumbled onto latency um, and irrefutable evidence that we actually had uh, circuit boards failing in the hands of customers with almost a 50% failure rate due to prior damage. We did failure analysis, uh, extensive work in the design lab and quality assurance, and we're able to prove beyond question that this was latent failure of a bipolar device due to ESD. Here's a case study uh, we did for a client where they discovered they had a class zero device. This was military also. Uh, they discovered they had a class zero device that they were unaware of. They thought it was a class one device or uh, let, you know, certainly not in class zero region. So we went on site to measure, uh, this is for HBM to measure body voltages in some extreme worse than worst case scenarios. And this was the worst case we could generate 
with the controls in place. Um, the device had a failure range shown here between, you know, this close to 100 and, uh, I know it's over, you know, it's maybe 160 volts to approaching 300 volts. So the device failure range was here. We know that latency typically results from damage close to the failure thresholds of devices. So for the latency to have occurred, there had to be stressing voltages in this region, right in the 150 volt range. Um, and again, the worst and worst case studies that we did showed that th this client never even closely approached 150 volts. So the possibility of latent damage here is uh, very close to zero. Okay, wrapping up with the final slides. Um, based on these myths and what we've learned uh, today, and hopefully you are aware of some of them earlier, is that uh, ESD actually has become a major source of failure. And especially at the circuit board level, it is um, sometimes the number one assignable cause of failure. And as we've said a couple of times now, class zero devices have failure rates as high as 100%. Here is actual data, uh, failure defect analysis um, from an IC supplier. These are, this is a real, real set of data points. Um, and here we know that this category is ESD damage, confirmed FA results. Now, what do we say earlier about circuit boards and the electrical overstress misdiagnosis? What we said is that the estimate is that approximately half of what was thought to be electrical overstress is really uh, ESD through the charge board event and cable discharge. And uh, we know that a certain number of the no trouble found failures or re defects are ESD. Some of them are intermittent or there's a variety of ways that can happen. But the message is that the contribution of ESD to these component failures is much higher than the simple ESD diagnosis. If we take this data and replot the data, taking these estimates into account, look what happens. ESD, let me go back up one here. ESD now here by itself is over here in the, in the noise. Now, introducing these other considerations, ESD uh, becomes the number one assignable cause of failure um, in many operations, not all. So these are the myths that we have debunked and hopefully um, you learned a few things and can uh, implement them. Um, I would encourage you to <clears throat> contact us with any questions. In fact, I know we're, we're approaching the end of the hour and a half. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to stay on a bit longer to answer them and would you know, welcome any questions you may have. You're welcome to either unmute your line or uh, raise your hand or use the chat window to do so. If not, we're gonna assume that you're all experts now. Let's see, we do have, looks like a few chats here. There's no picture, right? No. Okay, let's see. Arnie, have you had a chance to review these? Do you want to? Um... Um, I'm not seeing any anything in my chat window, Ted. Really, okay. Then let me, let me backtrack here. Um, Let's see, I've got one. Um, oh, one comment was uh, commenting about Jeff Donahue's uh, books for children. And um, again, all of the kids loved them. 
they're, they're really excellent. So go for it. Go, uh, you can uh, go to our website and click on Jeff's book and it will take you to where you can get them. Really, really, really well done um, um, books. Uh, let's see. Okay, let me go to another one. That's not so good. Okay, that's good. Let's see. Okay, I was asked to go back to myth number 11. So let me do that for you. Let's see, go back to myth 11. Uh, Gary wanted to reread this, so I'm just going to uh, show this to you again. Yeah, latency um, is a grossly overstated. Well, we, you know, we actually don't know. The example I gave you uh, was firsthand knowledge where we had 50% failure rates. Um, I would argue that 90% uh, of the problem for ESD is latent is not realistic. Zero is not either. The reality is that it's somewhere in between. And the example I gave you um, here was 50%. Con you know, confirmed, every, you know, accidentally confirmed, but we didn't do a study. This was, you know, diagnostics after the fact with uh, compelling evidence. I got it, Ted. Thanks for going back. You're welcome. Let's see what else we have. Okay, I think I think that's about it, but I'm, I'm pleased to have you unmute yourselves if you have other questions that you'd like to get into. Okay, uh, to repeat, um, this, will, this recording will be posted on our website next week. And you can go to our website uh, to learn uh, more about um, the classes that we're offering. And you saw some illustrations of it, you know, with the camera that we use. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good way to, it's, it's not as good, you know, as being in person, but it's very, very effective way of demonstrating the importance. Let's see, we do have some more and, questions coming in. Yeah, there's a question from Philip. Uh, should we drop HBM requirements and focus on CDM at the device level? I wouldn't drop them, no, Phil. Um, but I would say that CDM needs to be a priority and you need to, uh, we all need to get the data. As I said earlier, the IC suppliers make it painfully difficult to get in spite of the fact that it is required, it's mandatory for JETIC qualification. So uh, you can go to the IC suppliers and ask for the, uh, the JETIC uh, reliability report. I think it's JETIC 47. Maybe somebody else could do a fact check on that for me. But um, the point is you can get the information from them if you know what to ask for and who to ask it of. Let's see, what else we have here? Slide 19. Yeah. Okay, you see that? Yeah, thank you. What about circuit boards that have been encapsulated with foam? Well, that changes the dynamics dramatically because um, if the board is encapsulated, uh, you would have very limited direct access to the conductive elements. And the discharge is its most severe when you have metal to metal discharge. So that um, would definitely uh, greatly reduce the, the um, risk. What can kind I of board? Oh. Go ahead. I was gonna ask, could you go back to the slide where you show the part that has got an ionization on it and it only takes off half the charge? Oh, you mean the um, board, circuit board? Um, I forgot exactly what that was, but you showed that uh, the bar that you had there 
You it ionized fine. it. It was positive on both sides. Then you ionize it. You get rid of half of it. Oh, the okay. The side was still charred. Yep. I just Oops, need to I make went, a quick copy way. of that to explain to a couple of people that are coming over to my desk in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, where is that image? Let me go back here. There it is. This one. Uh, keep going. You got that shows both um both sides are clear, but go back where you had it touching the surface. Okay. You had the one side previous one. Yeah, that's it. Nope, back one. You had the bottom charged, the top didn't. That's both sides charged. Okay. Now you put ionization on it and you get rid of the top. Okay, your colleagues there to watch? Uh, no, but uh, I'm gonna just make a quick copy of it. Oh, okay, That's great, fine. okay. So now we introduce, the, this is before. Now mm -hmm. we introduce, introduce the ionization and you mitigate the charge on the top surface. That's it, exactly. Now we lift up the insulator and get the bottom half. Did you get all those? I can go a little slower. Um, Let me go back. You got that one. Yeah, one quick second. I need to. Okay. All right, I'm gonna go to the next stage. Yeah. You lift it up. Mm hmm And now the next stage, the ionization gets to that surface and you now have neutralized both sides. Exactly. Okay. If you can just hold that there for a moment, please. Yep. And I will try to copy it. While you're doing that, there was another question about what kind of board level testing would reveal latent ESD damage? Well, um, that's kind of a loaded question. It depends on your stage. You know, if you have failures and you're wondering if it's latency, you have to know the history of the board and Thank the you. handling of it. If you want to evaluate the risk of a board, um, experiencing a stressing current that could result in latent damage, then the work that Jeff does for us is the way to do that. You get, you can visualize, you can stress the board in, uh, you know, defined ways, you know, at, at different entry points and determine if stressing currents are getting to the most vulnerable devices or wherever you might want to know where the stresses may be propagating. So the, the, those are a couple examples. Um, be glad to discuss that in more depth uh, later if you like. Hi, Beverly, good to see you again, thank you. Jay Skolnick, oh my gosh, I, who let him in? Ginger, did you let Jay in? Jay Skolnick, I can't believe he was in the class. <laughs> um, anything else here, I think, We've answered the uh, questions. Anything else we can help with before we sign off? Okay. Thank you all. And um, let's all wish Ginger a continued speedy recovery with her voice. She's had laryngitis for a few days and it's been a relief for me and Arnie, but just kidding. We really miss her input, but um, we hope her uh, have a speedy recovery. And thank you, Arnie, for your help today. You're welcome. I'm going to leave. Okay. All right. Goodbye, Bye, everybody. All. Thank you. Thank you.